Большое спасибо мы хотим сказать друзьям нашего океанского лектория. Это Центр морских исследований МГУ за помощь в организации этих лекций. Ну а наш следующий гость – это Яна Терехова, научный сотрудник кафедры сейсмометрии и геоакустики геологического факультета МГУ. Ее тема сегодня для нас – это подводные ландшафты и методы их изучения. Яна, вам слово. Яна, микрофон. Да, добрый день. 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 The department uh, deals with seismometrics uh, and acoustics, so our uh, one of our directions and the field say, is the study of uh, the uh, earth uh, under the seafloor. So we look uh, not only under the water, we look uh, under the seabed, and I will tell you how we do it and why. So what uh, is the underwater landscape? I want to first uh, uh, give you a very uh, illustrative example. How we see it, uh, how we see the underwater landscape can be uh, described as a landscape. Uh, and uh, all of you uh, know it very well. You know uh, that the picture of the landscape and the uh, geography um, of this place um, have difference. So it includes the uh, information about the species living there, about the geology and geomorphology. And I want to focus on every point, uh, uh, an aspect of uh, underwater landscape later. I want to start with the uh, seafloor sediments. So here you see some photos of uh, the uh, seafloor sediments. Uh, uh, they can be very different. Um, they can, can include uh, some boulders. They can have uh, big boulders where we can see, uh, uh, for example, the mussels. It can uh, consist of silt. It can consist of sand. Naturally, with this same landscape, with the same relief, with the same uh, the same uh, sediments can form a uh, similar uh, landscape and different uh, landscape can form different uh, environment. Also, we need to uh, understand what uh, geomorphology, uh, ge geomorphological elements uh, exist there. Uh, there may be some heights, there may be some um, lower points, uh, they can include some other uh, types of landscapes. So this is uh, the uh, next aspect of the underwater landscape, which we need to uh, study and learn about. Uh, from this shape, it's impossible to see it, so that's why we need some special methods of studying them. The lithodynamic and hydrometeorological regimes are also important. Uh, what I'm speaking about here are uh, the waves uh, and uh, the streams. Uh, there are some uh, streams uh, which uh, exist in certain seasons. There are some storms near the uh, Coast. All of that actually influences the sediments uh, that exist on the seafloor. And all of this influences how these uh, uh, waves uh, and how these sediments are moving. Uh, 
практические примеры, которые я буду вам показывать. The practical examples that I will show you, uh, they come from the Bellamore station of our uh, university. Uh, it's situated on the uh, White Sea, and here you see uh, the uh, map uh, of the streams in the White Sea. So you see uh, the water comes this way, here there is a circle, and here there, that, that's, and then the water moves in this direction. So in Kandalakshk, in uh, Onish Bay, the processes and the streams uh, um, are different, so the there are some general streams and some local streams. For example, here you see an obstacle on the floor. And depending on the stream, uh, there might be some shape, uh, emerging. Также. Течения формируют разные виды реагентов. So the streams also uh, can be shaped, uh, can shape different waves. Also here on the uh, coast of the White Sea. You can see it very clearly here. So the uh, streams uh, uh, create the lethal dynamic regimes and what types of landscape we'll see there. Geology. That's what I'm going to speak uh, about now. And it's important uh, to know what was uh, in the geological history before we, uh, well, be before this landscape was formed. Landscape can be different uh, if uh, there were some glaciers there. So in the White Sea, uh, it includes some arenas, it includes some other types of uh, seafloor uh, landscapes. Or you can see the cones here, so there were some rivers. Uh, that brought a lot of materials uh, to the sea. So the uh, further you are from the coast, uh, the less uh, material you have and the material becomes very thin, very fine. So in the proximal zone, you can see some boulders in this zone, you can see uh, some uh, sands, and uh, in this uh, uh, zone, you have uh, very fine uh, 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 sands. You also need to know uh, what's sitting on this. Uh, uh, sea floor, and here I'm speaking about panthers, meaning the animals living on uh, its surface. Or uh, animals living uh, inside the ground. So it can be corals, uh, some fewers. This one is called the uh, head of Gargona. Uh, this can include some muscles. They can include also some worms. So the underwater uh, world is extremely diverse. And apart from the animals that yeah. exist on the floor, on the sea floor, there are also planktons, which are moved by uh, the water. There are some uh, bigger animals, uh, such as fish, uh, such as mammals, living inside the water. 
подводя итог тому, что я рассказала вам про подводный ландшафт, я хотела бы... Summing up the information about the landscape, I want to focus your attention on what right knowledge you need to have to describe the underwater landscape. Of course, one person cannot have so much knowledge because it's very diverse. That's why uh, the studying of this underwater landscape and underwater uh, seafloor includes the cooperation of scientists. On the one hand, it can include geologists and geographists. And on the other hand, it includes uh, biologists uh, and zoologists. And now I'll tell you about the methods of studying uh, the landscape, so the tools that we have right now uh, to learn what uh, wonderful landscapes are covered by the sea. And I will start uh, with the uh, seafloor itself. When we learn the depths, where we can build a certain model of the seafloor, and then we can put, uh, uh, we can understand what kind of elements exist there. Now, to study the depths of the seas, uh, we use uh, eco sounders. So, this method is based on the uh, use of uh, acoustic sound. For example, now I'm speaking to you, I'm, uh, I'm producing some waves, so this is a sound. It exists uh, in a certain range which uh, humans can understand. So there are also some ultrasounds and intrasounds. We can't hear it, but it exists. For example, some vibrations uh, with the ultrasounds, we can actually feel it. Here, we use uh, very uh, high frequency uh, sounds. They are sent uh, to the seafloor. And then they are uh, accepted by, uh, the, by the ship. So this wave goes uh, one way and the other. And we, judging by the uh, spe its speed, we can uh, understand what depth is. So the uh, multi-beam uh, eco sounder uses many of them. So the ship goes and we get uh, the whole um, uh, part uh, of uh, the uh, sea floor. So we manage to build a model uh, with a cell of uh, one meter by one meter. So everything that is situated on this mathematic map, we can see it. It's a, an amazing method of studying and it gives us a lot of information. It gives us the information about the depth, about the uh, landscape. The next method is the uh, side scan sonar. This is the next uh, stage in studying the seafloor. With multi-beam uh, sounders, we uh, paid attention to the time and to the speed. Here, we also take into account the um, the range of the uh, signal. As soon as uh, the sound uh, comes, uh, first it's reflected, 
uh, and you can see it, for example, in the mountains and with the echo in the mountains. So your voice uh, is reflected by the mountains and it goes back. So you hear the same thing that you said. So first thing that happens is the reflection, but um, uh, some sound is uh, uh, stuck in the ground. And part of that, part of this uh, sound comes uh, right back to the equipment. And we uh, studied the range. How to imagine dispersion? Let's imagine that we have a mirror and it's absolutely uh, even if we use a lamp, we will see uh, we will see a sun a reflection. But if we take another material, uh, we we will not see a sound beam, but uh, we can understand where the sun is, where, where the, the light comes from. Uh, if the um, surface is uneven, then we have a stronger signal coming back. So by this uh, side scan sonar, we can identify where the gravel is, where some other uh, aspects, uh, uh, some other products uh, lay. So gravel is pretty uneven and the inverse dispersion is very high. Mud is pretty even. That's why the inverse dispersion will be much lower, much less intensive that compared to gravel, say. After the mapping, after using this uh, side scan uh, sonar, we can uh, create a map of inverse dispersion and we can see that um, the, the white uh, stones uh, are the sands, uh, gray uh, zones represent silt or mud and if uh, we have a grayish uh, color then we can uh, suppose that this is uh, some kind of mixture. So site uh, scan sonar is a very useful and effective uh, tool of uh, studying the seafloor and uh, studying the lithology of the seafloor. As you remember, apart from uh, studying the seafloor, we also need to uh, see what's inside the crust. So for that, uh, we need uh, the uh, waves with lower uh, frequency. We use uh, seismic exploration for that and it uses the flexible vibrations. So seismic, uh, seismic exploration is a geophysical method of uh, exploring the geological objects, which are situated uh, uh, under the, uh, the floor. And we can use this method both on land and on the sea floor. So uh, there is a certain emitter of these vibrations. On the land, it can be uh, a big car. 
if this uh, car cars vibrate by that they uh, disperse these vibrations uh, in terms of C we can use different methods of using big underwater uh, blobs. So a certain amount of air is put in water. And first it uh, uh, explodes and in the water uh, uh, are produced, which lose some energy going through some layers. And then we try to accept uh, this, uh, to find the signals and uh, to build this geometry. Во всех, во всех физических методах, которые... No two physical uh, methods that are using elastic vibrations. Um, we take zero as a moment of uh, the reflection and then we hear the signal when it comes back. So they register the time of coming back of the signal. Uh, it is clear that from depth it comes uh, longer. So this is the seismic uh, sp uh, split, a uh, real one from the White Sea. This is the seabed. Here the scale is uh, not... Uh, the hor it's more horizontal than it's vertical. So so it's uh, more uh, dragged into the uh, in the vertical. So the span is 10 milliseconds. So it means uh, seven and a half millimeters. So the angle is uh, uh, half a degree. Um, for marine seafloor, it's, uh, um, well, we can say that it's no relief at all, almost. We see some uh, half opaque precipitations, and we see that the different matter starts. Uh, knowing the biological history of the White Sea, we can suggest that um, this is mo uh, moraine sediments because uh, the glacier was there in the White Sea. And the split normally uh, has three layers, the crystal, uh, crystal foundation, the moraine, and uh, glacial sand, uh, sediments. So we see them as the half opaque uh, part. I'm not going into details here of how to uh, make the difference between the layers. So, uh, we are going to talk about indirect methods of the study of the seafloor and what goes beyond. There are some direct methods too. So, first of all, are underwater observations. They can be... Uh, Uh, data uh, obtained uh, with help of divers when the diver just uh, goes in and uh, takes all the information and there are a number of ways to uh, register this information so the underwater video and photo footage here you see an, an underwater photo and this is a part or a screen from the video footage special uh, Equi uh, underwater equipment with cameras that can take photos and videos with uh, high quality uh, with projectors. 
for example, in the Red Sea, the visibility is much better and we can see f almost uh, uh, as far as 45 meters. So in other seas, the visibility is much worse. So the cameras must have uh, projectors and manipulators. So we can take a look underwater and we can take something from there. So the advantage of this uh, equipment is that they can go rather deep and they can work uh, longer than divers, for example. So the, um, the task of the appliance of these uh, methods is to confirm what we uh, get with other methods because uh, their sphere of apply applicability is limited. Uh, it, they can cost a lot and it takes time, human resources too. So um, they uh, are used after the indirect methods. So they are uh, to check the hypothesis, to check the data. Uh, we uh, use sampling too. So equipment is uh, put in the water from uh, from the boat uh, from the boat from the ship. This equipment can take a part of the sediment. This is a gravitation tube, so a column. Well, it's a tube, an iron tube, like the, uh, with this diameter, with a load. Uh, maybe uh, 100 kil uh, kilograms. Well, it's heavy. It uh, goes uh, straight to the soil. And you can uh, extract a whole tube of uh, untouched sediment sample. See, you can see it on the picture. Um, there exists other uh, sample triggers, for uh, so to speak, uh, small tubes uh, that goes uh, to the 30 centimeters depth, for example. They can, uh, there are tubes that uh, can give information about the depth of 20 meters. This is the maximum I heard of. In some regions, they uh, are in, installed and the split that we can get is quite impressive. We can uh, study the raw material. We uh, can see this. Uh, uh, the density, the humidity of the soil. We can uh, try its resilience and uh, for construction purposes, for example. Uh, this is the how you uh, determine the lithological type using sediments samples. Uh, there is a number of methods that is used to, to study benthos. It is uh, based on uh, samples, uh, uh, on sampling. Uh, so this equipment uh, only picks a part of the surface. So the soil is washed with water. All the animals that uh, got there are taken out. And then uh, with the microscope or with your eyes, you can look at it, um, you can describe the animals, etc. Underwater footage and video footage and divers are also used to uh, do that. So where, where can you do all this uh, brilliant stuff that I just talked to you uh, about? In the Moscow State University. There is a um, Belomorsk Marine Station. In, it is a research center. 
a number of uh, faculties uh, work there in teams. Obviously, uh, Faculty of Biology. Not all of the students from the faculty go to uh, the White Sea, but half of them, that's for sure. It's a very important uh, spot for biologists. This station was founded uh, by a PhD student and two uh, no, uh, bachelor students. They uh, picked a spot uh, to stay. And then this small uh, settlement uh, has enlarged and now it is um, it can accept uh, 200 people at once. This is a big research center, so, uh, uh, which is very well equipped technically, uh, very powerful microscopes. My, my education, uh, my, I'm a biologist, so uh, there are many things that biologists do in this observatory that is uh, beyond my education, but um, they organize uh, lectures, so any person, any lecturer can share the results of their work, and you can really uh, enlarge your horizons there. You can learn many new things, uh, find partners and colleagues for interdisciplinary work. Students from a geology a faculty also come uh, there. Paleontologists, lithologists work there. Biophysicists also work there. For many years, uh, geography students uh, study the relief and the contour of um, the shores. Students come there. Uh, physics faculty and uh, a number of other faculties bring they bring their students there to this observatory. This uh, place is incredibly. Uh, is incredibly good for people who uh, want to uh, study and investigate. I hope that I managed to transfer to you a part of the interesting things that you can see and hear there. I share with you the diversity of things that uh, natural science can, can do there. There are so many things that you uh, you cannot see with your own eyes. You can see it, feel it. And uh, get all, all the, this hype feeling that uh, is necessary if you do science. Three examples of uh, the landscape studies. How we do it in the White Sea? In, two, uh, in 2011, Vysoki Island was investigated. Uh, you see the geophysicist uh, phys uh, uh, data. Uh, points uh, serve to illustrate the sampling stations. Here, so the, the map of the reverse dispersion was created. We identified the type of the seafloor sediment. We classified this data. They are uh, silty, sandy, baldy. Uh, we use the statistical analysis too. We built a lithological map of the site. We made a, a morphogenetical mapping. We made a scheme, uh, a diagram where uh, we identified the lower points, moraine ridges, uh, the more even regions. Uh, 
we uh, were based uh, we were basing our data on seismic survey data if you don't know the ge geological structure um, it is um, impossible to uh, see the difference between the plateau and uh, um, uh, the upper the lower point for example this is the lithological uh, graph that we made and the result of our study goes as follows here we, uh, uh, this the dispersion of dimension class of Icelandica this is the small mollusk on the picture thanks to this underwater footage you can uh, see a couple of small holes here uh, these are uh, its siphon holes so it drinks from with the one and eats with the other uh, with the other so thanks to this study we know that in this uh, uh, lower point, uh, the frequency is minimal. On the uh, uh, plateau, uh, medium frequency. And on the hills, the maximum. Why do we need this? Uh, this mollusk, Arctica Islandica, it's a, a commercial, uh, commercializable. It, uh, we can eat it. And that's how we know where we can fish for this mollusk. Uh, another site that I would like to talk about, Velika Salma. In 2016, uh, we conducted a huge study that uh, included the whole number of uh, necessary methods. The uh, digital map of the seafloor was created. Uh, you can see it, that it's a um, it's a hollow. It has three uh, two banks. One of them harsh. Uh, the another one uh, more uh, smoother. Uh, it, uh, it's called uh, Azar. Uh, different terms are used. Uh, this is the form of the relief. Inside of the glacier, you can find rivers. So the uh, hollow, uh, river hollows, some materials is accumula accumulated. Clay, for example. And when the glacier is gone, these uh, sediments uh, prints the existence in the hollow. So if you here we had a river, this is how it looks like in the seafloor. It's not a hill, well, it's a ridge. So you can see it a uh, big SR and uh, uh, two small ones here. Here are the foundation coming out. This is an uh, underwater part. And more to the east starts a number of uh, islands. So the, this uh, uh, foundation part is, part of it is underwater and then it comes out. There was a big uh, work done in terms of side sonar, um, uh, side scan sonars, uh, to identify the composition of the sediments. Uh, there was a lot of work done in uh, using the distant methods, uh, sampling with uh, the zoning. So we studied and explored uh, several zones. Uh, 
and identified uh, and uh, uh, described different forms of landscapes. So the number of data that we used uh, was uh, extremely high. We used the attribute analysis as well as the cluster analysis. This is a semi-automatic interpretation of the data that we got, next to which we can identify the homogeneous zones and then give them a name. So the result of our work was uh, the uh, morphogenetic map And on this map, uh, you can see all the abiotic components of the underwater landscape. We took into account the geology, the types of sediments, uh, the geomorphological situation, and hydrometeorological regimes. And at the last stage, we included data about the uh, uh, species there, we put them on the map. And we created, well, we zoned uh, most parts of this bay uh, from abiotic and biotic uh, point of view. And the last point here is that this site is called the Aplashkin um, Island. We also did um, a seismic exploration, the hydrolocation, the side scan sonars. And this work resulted in the underwater uh, landscape map where all these zones uh, were described uh, in terms of the species, in terms of the uh, the panthers, in terms of the technology. So thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you, Jana. Thank you a lot. Your profession is extremely um, difficult. So thanks for uh, giving us such a good presentation. So you said uh, uh, something about the Bellamore uh, station. Is it possible for school students to participate in field inter internships there? Thank you very much for the questions. Um, school children from, uh, from uh, school number 192. Uh, this uh, is uh, the school specialized in biology and it has some internships and I'm know for sure that they bring it uh, to uh, another biology station close to Moscow. There is also a geology school um, under the geology uh, faculty and uh, professors uh, working at the department uh, uh, work also at the school and they uh, bring um, school children to field internships uh, and to the Crimean uh, side uh, uh, of the department where the first and second year students of the geology uh, department go there so if they uh, spent uh, uh, one month uh, uh, near Bakchisarai in the Crimea. There is also, actually there are several um, uh, clubs here in Moscow, in Perm, and in other cities of Russia, which organize for their um, club members such internships. I guess that in the big cities you can find this opportunity and I invite uh, you all to uh, enter 
geology uh, the, uh, faculty, uh, the biology faculty of our university, uh, so that we would spread the knowledge about our planet and we collect it and uh, to uh, treat it uh, with great care. Thank you very much, Jana. If our listeners have any questions, uh, you can uh, send them to our official website and uh, in the near time uh, we will publish these answers uh, on our website Jana, again thank you very much thank you uh, for being with us today thank you very much for this opportunity thank you this was an ocean lectorium and we proceed to the next lecture